Um, thanks for coming to my, uh, to my talk. I know it's the last talk of the day, so I'll try to uh, keep it moving so we can all go home. Uh, this talk is called All Your Network Monitoring is Probably Wrong. Greetings. Um, I'm Joe. I like computers. Uh, sometimes I tweet. I'm just Joe D'Amato on Twitter. Um, and as you mentioned, I'm the uh, CEO and founder of a company called Package Cloud. We make it easy to create repositories of uh, Debian, RPM, RubyGem, Python, and Java packages. Uh, it's pretty cool. You should check us out. Uh, if you want to follow along, the slides are all online. Uh, there's going to be like lots of links and stuff in the in the slides, so you can check out the slides online and you know follow some of the links and stuff like that um, later if you like. Uh, I've also tweeted the slides with the with the JIDS uh, 2017 hashtag on Twitter, so you can just search that hashtag and find it also. Uh, okay, so I want to begin my um, talk by talking about a concept called cognitive load. And cognitive load is this idea from uh, like cognitive science and psychology and such that uh, cognitive load refers to like the total amount of mental effort you need to, you need to use to keep information in your working memory. Um, and sort of one of the ideas behind this talk that I'm, that I'm giving right now is just that there's just too much stuff, uh, especially when it comes to computers. And um, when, there's so when there's so many things you have to understand to you know, build software, deploy software, get software running, build infrastructure, what ends up happening is that programmers and operations people end up having to take shortcuts and they have to take shortcuts because there's just too many things to know because they can't keep everything in their, in their mind at the same time. And I think like sort of one symptom of this is what, I, you know, what you see a lot, like I see this a lot, like people will Google, like how do I configure Apache? How do I configure Nginx? How do I configure MySQL? And you know, people will go and copy and paste conf configuration files you know, from Stack Overflow or from the internet or whatever directly into their computers. And I, like, my claim is basically that the reason why people do this is just because there's too many things that you have to know to get your job done on a daily basis as a programmer. And it's just impossible to know how every single piece of software works, right? Like, if you're, if you're deploying a web service, your web service might use like five or six different pieces of software, right? Like, you know, Ruby, Redis, MySQL, whatever, right? It's just impossible to know how to configure all of those things properly. And so people will end up just Googling stuff copying it from the internet and pasting it into their computer. Um, and I think that's sort of like a really natural reaction. Um, by the way, uh, this idea of like, you know, copying and pasting stuff and not having enough time to understand how things work is part of another talk that I'm working on called Programmers Should Get Paid More and Work a Lot Less. Um, anyway, um, I don't know if any of you in this, in this room have ever copied and pasted like configuration settings or, you know, kernel tuning parameters or anything. Um, you know, off the internet, and perhaps you've copied things you didn't fully understand. Um, I definitely know I have, right? Like, I've needed to set up like Nginx before, or Redis before, or whatever. And you know, I just don't have time to read about every single you know individual option for every single piece of software. So I don't know. Like, probably most people have copied and pasted stuff they didn't really understand off the internet to use on their computer, right? I think that's pretty normal. And like I said, I think this is just because there's just too much code. Um, and similarly, right? Like. If any of you have ever set up any monitoring things, like you know, Nagios or CollectD or something like that, um, when you set these things up initially, right, they all come with like a huge number of graphs that graph all types of system metrics, like everything from like CPU usage to disk space to network usage and everything in between. And my claim is that like if you if you you know if if you if you agree with me that people don't have enough time to understand how to configure their applications properly, then perhaps you would also agree that, um, you know, likewise, people don't have enough time to really understand every single graph or every single metric that, that their monitoring solution is generating. Um, and, you know, probably not, like most people probably don't understand every single graph, right? Like an example, like I remember one time when I was setting up uh, CollectD, someone asked me, oh, what does this graph of entropy mean, right? Like, I'm sure that like if any of you have set up like Munin or Collecti or whatever, you'll see some graphs that get generated that you know you probably never heard of before. Don't make much sense. And this this happens for the same reason that people copy stuff off the internet to configure their applications, right? There's just there's just too much code, um, and if there's too much code to configure and tune properly, 
and that's why you know people use Stack Overflow or people you know copy stuff off of blogs, then you know what makes a programmer think they can actually monitor all this code that's really complicated. And my claim is that you can't monitor any of this code. It's just too hard. Um, but it probably doesn't really matter, but I'm going to talk more about why it doesn't matter that it's impossible to monitor software later. Um, so anyway, my claim is that the more complex a system is, the more difficult it is to monitor. And I don't necessarily think that complexity is bad. Like, like I think complexity is sort of a fact of life. And I can give you an example of you know, complexity in software that I think is okay. Um, I, don't, I don't know if any of you are familiar with this, this game, this iPhone game. This is a really popular game in the US. Um, this is a cat game. Basically in this game, you just, you, know, you just take care of cats, you feed them, and you play with them and stuff like that. It's a really, really popular game. And um, you know, when you're playing this game, right, like you have a few things that you want to do when you're playing this game. right? Like You want to download and play the cat game on your phone. Um, you know, you want to message your friends at the same time. You want to, you know, buy stuff in the app. You want to do it over, you know, SSL so it's secure, but you're attached to a VPN. And you want to do all this while you're flying in an airplane, let's say. Right? And I, I think that that's okay, right? Like, I think, you know, uh, I don't think complexity is necessarily bad, right? Like, software is complex because the things people want to do with it, whether they're serious things or just playing video games, I think that that's okay, right? Like, I think software is supposed to be complex because the things that we want are complex. Um, and you know, to sort of illustrate my point about why I don't think complexity is bad, right? I hear a lot of programmers say this, like, complexity is bad, you should make your software as simple as possible. I don't necessarily agree because I think that there are many systems that we use in the real world that are complex that aren't necessarily bad. Um, so, so just two quick examples of things that are complex but not necessarily bad. This is uh, just a map of the interstate highway system in the US. So in the US, like, we have a lot of highways that connect every single state together. And this is really, really complicated, right? Like, there's lots of different ways to drive around the country. Um, but it's not necessarily bad, it's just complicated. Uh, and similarly, this is a map of the, the Tokyo subway system, right? Like, this is a really, really complex system, but just because it's complicated doesn't mean it's, it's necessarily a bad thing. Uh, and so that brings me to my point. So, like, one thing that's really complicated is the Linux networking stack, right? It's like one of the most complicated pieces of software that I personally have ever seen. And, uh, the, and, and one of the reasons why it's really complicated, right, is because it has so many features. Um, and there's so many different like hardware devices, right, and each of these hardware devices have different like transmit queue lengths or, re you know, uh, receive queue lengths and different default settings. There's sort of weird things you can do with your network devices, like you can combine them together, so you can combine like two NICs together, four NICs together, and create you know, an Ethernet bonded device, which is pretty weird. There's all kinds of weird performance things you can do, like IRQ modulation or filtering at, at the hardware level. Um, there's lots of like, really interesting software things that people do to sort of optimize their, their network processing, like receive side steering, packet steering, flow steering. Um, there's also like, weird software things like Receive offloading, send offloading, hardware accelerated VLAN IDs, time stamping. There's just like all this crazy stuff. Uh, and most people who are using networking um, you know, on a Linux computer are using at least two protocol stacks, right? Like, so on top of like all these crazy hardware features and software features, you're also using at least the IP protocol stack and probably the TCP protocol stack, maybe also the UDP protocol stack. And there's just like all kinds of tuning knobs, right? Like you can adjust pretty much everything here. Like every single thing can be adjusted or tuned or configured in any way you want. And there's all kinds of bugs. Like all that, all that software is like super, super buggy and barely works. And the best part about it is that there's basically, literally, actually, really no documentation for any of it. Um, and if you want to know how it works, right, like, like there's, one there's like one really amazing example of how there's no documentation for any of this. So there's, there's a file um, called, you know, uh, procnet. And uh, this, is a, a fa this is like a really amazing post to a mailing list for the Linux kernel where someone's posting asking, how can I find out the procnet info? For example, what is softnet stat? Like what does this statistic do? What is the purpose of it? And uh, the answer that was proposed to this person on the internet was, much of this is only well documented in the code. Here's an attempt uh, at interpreting softnet stat. No guarantee that this is correct. Uh, read the code. And th this is like from someone who actually works on this part of 
the Linux operating system. He's like he's saying, I'm going to try to explain what this means, but I don't actually know if this is right. Uh, and and his you know his explanation is okay. There's this thing. It's called total. It's the number of packets that have been sent. Um, and there might be some double counting, like maybe we count some of this information twice. No one really knows. And then he says, oh, I think the intention was that these were originally on separate receive paths. Um, you know, who knows, right? Um, but, and, and that's sort of the thing, right? Like, this code is so complicated, and it's been there for so many years, and it's been modified over and over and over again that there's just lots of bugs with like how the statistics for the Linux networking stack have been, have been accounted for. And the only way to really like answer this question is sort of what this guy was saying, which is that you have to read all, you have to read the code. Um, so anyway, I, I actually read all the networking stack code and I did like a full write up. It's 90 pages long and it's literally everything there is to know about Linux networking. Uh, you can check it out. It's just online. It's just bitly slash Linux dash networking. Um, and you know, a lot of people would look at a write up like this and be like, okay, your write up is 90 pages long. That just means that like the Linux networking stack is really complicated. It's impossible for anyone to understand. And I would say that like it's fine, it's fine as long as we're honest that like this is the reality of the software that we use today. Like nothing is easy, and I think that people take this for granted. Like people don't want to admit that you know software is really complicated, especially the really important pieces like the operating system. Um, so usually, like you know, when I've given this talk before, like I, I can tell the future, right? So like if I if I take out my tarot cards right now, there's probably like someone in the audience that's thinking like, oh, right, like. FreeBSD or Plan 9 or Windows or whatever has a better, faster, leaner, whatever networking stack than Linux. And I would say like that's a really boring thing to say and also you're wrong. Um, but anyway, um, so like complexity, right? Like it's, complexity doesn't necessarily mean that something's inefficient. It doesn't necessarily mean that something's bad. Um, like I said before, people expect lots of complicated things when they're using uh, a computer system. And so there's a lot of code that needs to be written and understood to support all these use cases that people have, right? Like all the different protocol stacks, all the different like weird Ethernet configurations, right? That's all lots and lots of code that has to get, you know, written, tested, and, and used. Um, and that just sort of goes back to like the cat game example I was giving you before. But the bad news about like having really complex software systems is that, you know, you're supposed to figure out some way of monitoring this really complicated code. And then you're supposed to be able to look at these graphs that you've created. And when something goes wrong, you're supposed to use these graphs to tell you the answer, to tell you what actually went wrong, why it went wrong, and how to prevent it in the future. And like that sounds really, really difficult, but uh, it gets even better than that. Uh, so like I'm going to give you a bunch of examples of like really interesting bugs in the Linux networking stack to try to convince you that like none of the none of the code that's written to monitor the Linux networking stack can possibly be correct because the things that that code is monitoring are giving false information to begin with. Um, so my first example is um, there was a driver bug that caused statistics. That, so there's this file on, on Linux called procnet dev, which a lot of monitoring tools will read data out of to tell you like how many packets have been transmitted, how many packets have been received, and so on. Um, it turns out that there was a driver bug that caused like output in this file to be incorrect, right? So um, there's, this, there's a driver for a device called the IGB driver. It's like a really, really popular driver for an Intel uh, network device. And what was happening is that the driver was outputting statistics with a timer that only fired every two seconds. So that meant that if you were reading the ProcNet dev file more often than every two seconds, you were getting stale statistics. Um, but if you use a different tool to read the same statistics, if you use ETH tool instead, that was hitting a different code path, so you'd get more up-to-date statistics. Um, and you, you, know, you can avoid this, this, this weird bug in like, you know, proc dev, procnet dev if you just use ETH tool instead. Um, and I actually saw this bug in production. Like, I actually saw graphs that were being generated with bad statistics in production, and it made it really difficult for us to debug some network problems we had because, again, the graphs we were generating were based off of this driver that was actually incorrect. But like this sort of bug only really matters if you're monitoring your network stats more often than every two seconds. And you know maybe you aren't maybe you aren't doing that, right? Because like maybe you just don't care. Like maybe it's not important to you. Like maybe you don't need to have real time network statistics, right? And that's fine. Like you're probably right. Like maybe you don't. Maybe most people don't actually need that, right? But if you are one of those people that that do need statistics at that like at that you know at that interval at that you know 
with that freshness. Um, what you'll need to do then to fix this bug is like, you would need to notice that there's a problem in your graph. You need to read all your stats collecting code in like Munin or CollectD or Nagios or whatever. Realize that the bug is not in that code. Then read the, you know, the code for your device driver. Realize the bug's in the driver. Write a patch for it. Rebuild the driver, blah, blah, blah. Like you have to do a huge amount of work, right? Like that's a huge amount of work just to figure out how many bytes were received or sent from your computer. That's a huge amount of work to figure that out. Um, which brings me to a list of things that don't exist. Um, descending order of probability that it doesn't exist. There's no such thing as free open source software. There's no such thing as a singularity. And then there's no such thing as calorie free chocolate covered bacon and so on. Um, so if you were paying attention, right, like in the previous slide, you saw that like if you just use ETH tool, you can avoid this bug in, you know, proc dev net, right? So maybe at this point I would say like, I would see the future, someone's thinking like, okay, that's fine, I don't care, Joe, like I'll just use ETH tool. Um, so maybe, you know, maybe you don't know what ETH tool is. ETH tool is just a, a command line tool. You can just run it from, you know, your, your command prompt. Uh, the way it works is it uses a system call called the IOCTL, it's a, the IOCTL system call and that's how ETH tool, a command line program, communicates with a network device driver. Uh, but sort of the sad thing about this, about this tool is that not every network device driver actually implements this interface, meaning that you can't necessarily use this tool for every network device. It'll just depend on the driver and the device you're using, whether or not it actually works. Um, and even better than that, the devices that actually do implement it, all of them do it differently. So you can't really rely on the information making sense between different versions of, uh, of a particular device or between different devices. Um, so, you know, what if, I, what if I told you, as I just said, right, that like there's no standardized way of outputting driver statistics. Some drivers don't even implement that interface and the ones which do implement it all use different field names. So I'll give you an example of like three drivers that are completely, that give completely different answers when you use ETH tool. So uh, if you're using EC2, you're probably using the VIF driver. Um, there's another famous driver called the IXGBE driver which is used on like a lot of, um, like server class hardware. And then there's the IGB driver that I mentioned before that had the bug initially, right? So I'll, I'll show you like the output on all three of these drivers with the same tool and you'll see that they're completely different. So on EC2, if you run uh, ETH tool dash S to get your statistics output, the only statistic you get is this really cryptic one, RX GSO checksum fix up. Um, what even is that? Who knows? Um, on my IXGBE device on a real computer, if I run ETH tool, I don't get one statistic, I get 377 statistics. Uh, looks like that. Of those 377, how many of them match the statistic that was output by the thing on EC2? None of them. Um, so on another piece of hardware, right, on the IGB, if I run ETH tool, I get 112 statistics. Right, of those 112, how many of those are RX, GSO, checks on fix up? None of them, right? But IGB and IXGB are both Intel devices. So surely two devices made by the same company will have similar statistics, right? Um, it turns out that's not true. So if you check the difference between the statistics output on IGB and IXGBE, you get 316 different statistics. Um, and it gets better, right? Like some of the statistics are measured in the driver, some of the statistics are measured in hardware, right? And, and this is sort of, you know, brings me back to like a, a thing that I hear a lot of people who, who do like monitoring stuff on their computers very often, people will say things like, you should monitor all the things, right? Like I hear this all the time, like monitor everything. Um, I think monitoring everything is a terrible idea because you end up monitoring things you just don't understand. Like here's a few statistics that like you'll get if you run ETH tool that don't make any sense. Like uh, here's one, RX no DMA resources, like what does that mean? Non EOP desks, what does that mean? OS to BMC, RX by BMC, like what is this, right? Like if you monitor all these things, you're getting all this data and you're storing it and you're graphing it and none of these things like make any sense to a human being. Um, so like maybe at this point, you know, you're thinking, okay, like this is fine. I'll just read the driver source code. I'll figure out what all this means. I'm really good at like Linux kernels. I can read all this stuff. So, okay, like let's do that, right? Like we, we look in the kernel, we want to find out what one of these means. 
Okay, we found this weird one called I, IXGBE QPRDC, right? Like, what is that, right? Like, like you want to know what the statistic means because you're, you're collecting it, you're graphing it. What does this mean? Um, this statistic actually reminds me, I, I don't know, like, if any of you are familiar with this, but, like, in some Nordic countries, they have, like, names of cities that are, like, 100 letters long. That's kind of, like, what this, this driver statistic reminds me of, right? It's just, like, a bunch of letters together that don't mean anything. Um, it turns out that this particular statistic is just a, a register read, so this driver just reads data off of the actual network device itself, like off of the hardware, um, and it does this by reading register values. So, like, one way of finding out what this means is by looking at the documentation for the device, right? So, like, let's say we're like, okay, let, we should be able to find this in the, in the data sheet for the actual network device, right? So, we, we download the, the data sheet. Here it is, it's 1,260 pages long. Uh, you scroll down to page 689, and here is QPRDC, right? Q packets receive drop count. Um, so, you know, this is amazing, right? Success. So now, if you want to understand what all of your statistics mean, all you have to do is just repeat this process, right? Like, download your driver source code, read it for every single statistic, figure out if the statistic is measured in software or hardware, if it's the software, read the driver, figure out what it means. If it's in hardware, find the data sheet and see if it's described there, and then graph it, and then figure out what the graph means. Right, like, you just keep going on and on and on and on forever to understand like, an infinity number of statistics that are, that are measured by networking devices in the network stack. Um, and it gets even better than that, right? Like, what if I told you that a lot of the statistics that are output by, by like, ETH tool or other tools in the system aren't even documented in the data sheet for the device itself. So there's literally nothing you can do to understand what some of these statistics mean other than just guess. Um, you could email the device manufacturer, but um, good luck with that. Chances are they're not gonna like, respond to you or tell you what any of, the, any of the statistics you get from their devices actually mean. Um, so I don't know, maybe you're thinking at this point like, okay, cool Joe, like no one cares. No one cares about you know, NIC level statistics. Uh, it's too low level for me. Um, you know, I don't have this bug that you mentioned before about proc net dev, I, I don't care about any of this. Uh, it works for me, I, I just care about high level statistics, right? Like, I just care about errors, about drip, about drops, FIFO, frame, compress. I care about these high level errors that I can find in this file that, you know, works on my computer because I don't use the driver that you mentioned before. Okay, I think that that's, that's fair, like maybe that's all you care about, but what do errors, drops, FIFO, frame, and compressed actually mean. Um, it turns out to find out what they mean, you have to dig, you know, you have to dig into the kernel source code, you find a piece of code like this, uh, and it turns out that like all these statistics that come out of this file, all these fields come from the device driver itself. Um, so, again, some are from software, others are from hardware. Um, and some of the fields, like errors, drops, and so on, are actually sums of other fields. And you know, this sort of reduces your, your, your data sheet search space, so it makes it, you have to like dig through that huge, you know, 1200 page PDF, like a lot less. You can just search for the fields you care about, right? Um, but it becomes painful if you have lots of different network devices in production because different drivers don't agree on what each of the individual statistics actually mean, right? So in other words, like, what if like Rx missed errors, which is a, a really common error for a network device to track, what if that error means something different for each network device you query? Um, like, is that a thing that happens? And the answer is that yes, every single network device is different. So like, you know, an RX dropped error can mean something different depending on which device you're actually looking at, uh, which makes it really, really painful. Um, and so the meaning of driver statistics are not standardized between different devices. But by the way, um, the actual meanings can change for the same device, right? So like a device with a particular firmware version, after that firmware gets upgraded, maybe that statistic means something else later. Um, and so that makes it even harder, right? Like if you, if you want to actually track these statistics, you need to do a bunch of things. You need to, you know, figure out which network devices you're using in production on all your machines, figure out which firmware version you're using on every single network device, figure out which versions of which drivers you're using for each network device, read all the driver source code for all the versions you care about, read the data sheet for every firmware version you care about, 
and then build some kind of plug-in for your monitoring system to encapsulate all this knowledge and monitor it, right? So this is like very obviously impossible for any human being to do, but this is what you would need to do if you wanted to actually monitor your networking statistics. Um, but again, like maybe you look at this and you say, okay, this is higher level than what you talked about before, but I still don't care, right? This is still too low level for me. I only care, I only care about protocol level statistics, right? Like maybe you're just gonna say like, okay, I don't actually care about how my actual network device performs. I only care about the IP protocol stack or the TCP protocol stack or the UDP protocol stack. I don't care about individual network devices. Um, I would say that's kind of weird because by adjusting settings in ETH tool, you can actually eliminate a lot of protocol problems. Um, so I've actually done work for people before where like you can modify settings on your network device using ETH tool and actually increase throughput and, and network processing on your system. Um, but whatever, like maybe you don't actually care, that's fine, right? So maybe you'd say, okay, let's just read protocol stats from this file, procnet SM SNMP. And you know, your argument for reading this file instead of doing, instead of doing anything more complicated is that, hey, like, there's, an, there's an RFC, RFC 2013, that specifies what fields should be in this file. So that's cool. The fields are, the fields are standardized. Um, it's, really, it's much higher level, so I can figure out where the protocol errors are breaking down. I don't need to dig into the driver source code. I don't need to dig into like, any low-level code. I don't need to read you know, network device uh, data sheets. And all this stuff is gathered in software, so I don't need to know anything about hardware. I can just read software. I know software. It's a lot easier for me, right? And that's a lot easier than reading a 1,200-page data sheet like I showed before. And it's true, it is. But um, what if I told you that there's a ton of bugs in the way that that file is generated? Um, there's many cases where the statistics in the SNMP file are incremented incorrectly or incremented in the wrong place. There's lots of cases of double counting. Um, in different kernel versions. And there are several cases where counters that you expect to be incremented uh, aren't incremented in the areas you think they should be incremented. Um, so an example of that is in Linux kernel 3.13, there's these, there's these two bugs. There's like sort of this bug with how packets that are discarded, what statistics counter is used to measure them. And uh, this comment is saying, this is like a comment for the UDP protocol stack. The comment is saying that, like, okay, there's two cases where I might just drop a packet on the floor because I can't process it, but I don't have a way of indicating which of the two error conditions it is. So in both cases, I'm just going to call it IP out discards. But these two error cases are very different, right? Like, the first error case means that I ran out of kernel memory, which is like a pretty serious problem. And the second, um, the second error case is that like, there's no send buffer space, which is something that you could configure by just modifying a, a, a tuning setting on your computer. But there's no actual way of expressing the difference between these two. So both of these errors, one which is not correctable and one which is correctable, are both measured and, and reported as just one statistic. So there's no way of separating them. So there's no way for you to know whether or not you know, uh, packets that are being discarded is a correctable error or not a correctable error. And so if this, if this is an important statistic for you, like if the performance of your IP network is important to you, then, and you're monitoring like, you know, IP out, the IP out discards value, right? Like your monitoring for this might be wrong because you might be thinking it means something that it doesn't, right? Um, so anyway, this is sort of the end of the talk here, but like, so like, what does this all mean, right? Like, um, like, what do all these bugs and network monitoring and the network stack and the device drivers and the firmware and all that, what does it all actually mean? Um, I think what it means is just that, like, monitoring something that's really complicated requires a really, really, really deep understanding. Um, otherwise, you know, your graphs, the alerts you set on your graphs, um, you know, maybe your graphs are not actually measuring what you think they're measuring. And this is sort of why people build like entire businesses around monitoring networks or monitoring other aspects of computers because you know software stacks are really really complicated. Um, and so I would urge like programmers like I, I've talked to people about this before and you know I think like a common expression by a programmer is like oh I can fix this I can just write a simple bash script to like monitor all this stuff. Um, I would say like you should resist that urge to just write a simple bash script because a lot of these problems are a lot more complicated than that, right? Um, Properly monitoring, setting alerts, and so on requires a significant amount of investment, right? Like 
both um, you know, with, t with engineering time, but also like financial investment, like you actually have to pay people to sit there and read all this code and understand how all these things work if you want to monitor them properly. Um, it's not just as simple as writing a quick script over the weekend. And again, I don't think this is necessarily bad. I think it's just important to think about. Um, so, you know, nothing is free. Uh, this doesn't mean that complicated software is bad, like, so don't, don't jump to, to that conclusion. This is, this is just like the reality of the situation. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's my talk. Um, network monitoring is hard. And, you know, if your network monitoring is sort of based on the statistics values that I was mentioning before or the device drivers that I mentioned or anything like that, then there's a good chance that perhaps the graphs you're generating are incorrect and they don't tell you what you think they're telling you. Um, so anyway, that's it. Well, you know, thanks. Thanks for listening. Sorry, I can't hear you because the fans are too loud. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I never use Windows because it's terrible, so I don't know, sorry. Uh, no, so my, my company is not a networking company. Um, I just like, so I'm a, I'm a kernel programmer for fun. So like I, I like to read and write uh, like, you know, kernel code or operating system code and device driver code. So I mean, like this talk came about um, just because um, several years ago a networking company hired me to do like a deep analysis of, like they were looking, they had all these like these graphs and they wanted to know like, what do these graphs mean or how do we make our network, like, how, you know, they're selling a network software to people and they wanted to make their networking code a lot faster. And they're like, okay, we want to understand these graphs. And so I, I did like some consulting work for them where I went and I like actually read all the source code for every part of the Linux networking stack and the device drivers they were using. And I found like a lot of interesting things, like the bugs that I mentioned, like all throughout the networking stack. And that sort of led us, that sort of led me to show them that like, hey, a lot of these graphs that you've set up here aren't actually measuring anything that's like meaningful to your business or, or aren't measuring anything that actually like makes sense to you, right? Um, and as I talked to more and more people as I was doing that, I noticed that like a lot of people were looking at graphs of like, packets dropped or packets received and getting like weird or inconsistent values. And it turned out that like a lot of people who were doing that assumed that all the, that you know, the source of this data that they were collecting was actually correct. Um, but it turns out it's, it's not, right? Like if, if the data is really important to you, you actually have to investigate and see how the data is generated, right? So that you know that it's correct or that you can verify that it's measuring what you think it's measuring, so. Yeah. Um, I don't think so. So, like, I mean, there's uh, tons of bugs. So, I, I so I used to work um, at VMware on. Uh, I used to work on the ESX kernel, and um, the ESX kernel had sort of the same number of bugs um, in its own protocol stacks as Linux kernel has. Like, like I don't think software being paid or, or free really matters. And there's a lot of companies that actually sponsor development of Linux kernel because they sell devices that come with like Linux embedded on them. Um, I think this is just a side effect of software being complicated, as I mentioned at the beginning, right? Like we have really complicated use cases for software now and there's lots of different protocol stacks layered on top of each other, really complicated networking devices, different ways of layering network devices together for failover or to increase throughput or whatever. And a side effect of all that complication is just that like, the software gets really, really, really complicated, and so there's like lots of really, really difficult bugs to track down and, and figure out. So, I, I, in my opinion, I mean, I could be wrong, but like this is my opinion. I don't, I don't think it's related to the fact that Linux is a free operating system. So, all of these bugs are the um, So, well, it depends on which version of the kernel of the kernel you're running. Um, like, if you're running, um, you know, like the Procnet dev bug that I mentioned, um, that one's actually still pretty recent. Um, I still see some people, like people, still complain to me about seeing that bug um, you know, on their production systems. The last one that I mentioned about the, the packets being discarded, that's still in the kernel as of like right now. Um, but, that, but the thing is, is that's, that's not really like a bug, that's just the problem where the actual like statistics that are um, outlined in the RFC, like the SNMP statistics, 
don't have like granular enough fields to be able to express the difference between a correctable error or an incorrectable error. So they just lump them all together as just there's errors, right? Um, and I think that that's, that's, sort of, that's sort of the problem as, as you go higher level in like in any software stack and you do like higher level monitoring, you lose some granularity, right? Like the trade-off there is like you don't like, maybe you don't want to actually go and read all this code and figure out like there's two different types of errors, one is correctable, one's not, right? Like maybe that's too complicated so you can monitor this higher level statistic instead. But if you do that, or the side effects is that maybe like there's, you know, you're getting errors that you could actually fix, right? Um, by tuning your network device or something, so. Yep. Sorry, I, I can't. I really can't hear you. Can you speak louder? Yeah. So, um, uh, in in the talk, I, I linked to a bunch of blog posts that I that I that I wrote about the Linux networking stack. Um, I have a lot of other blog posts that I've written about like. Linux system calls and like done, I've done like lots of deep dives. Um, all that stuff is on um, my company's blog. It's just blog.packagecloud.io. Uh, if you search the, the JIDS 2017 hashtag on Twitter, you'll be able to find the slides that I posted with links to like all the blog posts about like networking or other stuff. Um, and all those blog posts are like completely free. So if you want to read them or read about the Linux networking stack, you can check them out. And in those blog posts, I outline every single statistic for every layer of the networking stack and what they all mean. So if you do need to monitor like networking stuff on Linux, uh, you can read this. You can read some of the blog stuff that I've written and see like what each of the statistics mean and where the data comes from and all that. So you don't have to actually go and read like you know a million lines of code like I did. So.